I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. All right, Rowan Taylor, welcome back to the podcast, mate. How are you? Hey, good, Brett. How are you, mate? Good to see you. I'm good. Uh, we've obviously got the quarantine backdrop still. I've done a couple of other coaches, <laughs> and, and you guys oh, yeah. all have the same backdrop. Yeah, no, I've got this is the real backdrop. This is the green door to the, uh, to the fridge <laughs> and the white door to the toilet and then the <laughs> front door to my porch. So that's all I've got in here. So that's it. Mate, you got stuck there too. How come you guys decided to come back early and not stay for the whole uh, games to the closing ceremony? Nah, we were required to leave within 48 hours of our competition finishing. That was part of right. the, rule, the rules, whether it be IOC or AOC. I'm not sure who, whose rules it was, but <clears throat> teams had to get out within 48 hours. So we, we, we requested an extra night, like, it could have been that night swimming finished and we could have been out. I know a few other sports left pretty much. They packed their bags and as soon as they got back to the village, they left. We, we wanted to have another night there. Um, <clears throat> we flew out the next night. They, they, they said a, a maximum of 48 hours. So we, we, we decided to take up at least have a, a day and a half where we could, um, you know, enjoy being in the, in the village environment with the Australian team in particular. Right. Yeah. Well, listen, hey, mate, congratulations. It's been uh, over a year now, about a, a year and a month since we last spoke where you first took the job here um, yeah. as the head coach of Australia. So um, <laughs> congratulations, mate. Fantastic result. No, thank you very much. Very humbling. Um, you know, great group of coaches and obviously fantastic athletes to work with. So, you know, I found um, uh, my experience with, with the national team previously and, and the experience with um, – uh, you know, being on the team and knowing the coaches so well really helped me just kind of, uh, you know, keep, keep those relationships going, but more importantly, help them to continue to prepare for what was hoping we were hoping was going to be a games, which had ended up happening. But the time I took over, it wasn't happening. So I was kind of flying blind at the time. Yeah, for sure. Now, listen, uh, from what I can see here, it looks like a total of eight gold medals and uh, and, and total of 20 overall medals 
Um, mate, that's exceptional. Did that exceed your expectations? It was actually nine gold. And oh, nine gold. gold. Who did I 20, miss? 21 because we picked up the bronze with uh, Karina Lee in the open water. Which right, is right. right, okay. So I've got, listen, here's my gold. I've got Zach Stubbley Cook in the two breasts. I've got <laughs> Kaylee McEwen for the 100, 200 back, 400 medley relay. I got Emma McKeon, 500 free, and, um, and then Ariane Titmus, 200, 200 400. Who am I missing then? Four by one free relay, women. Oh, four by one free relay. There we go. See? Oh, I'm glad I got the head coach here to correct me. That was an outstanding race, by the way. That was incredible. Um, yeah. I mean, you could have probably put an A and a B team up and still maybe gone first and second there if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah. No, so talk to me. Was, uh, de the depth there was incredible. And um, I think, um, you know, we, we, um, we maximize that relay really well. Well, listen, one of the things I noticed that I saw uh, early on, you know, that documentary came out early in the year, Head Above Water, and, and it, it showcased what you were doing specifically and what the Australian team were doing. Um, and it seemed to me that you guys um, were were lucky in the way that Australia handled it originally, the, the, the COVID situation where they'd kind of locked the country down and allowed the country to still move, where, whereas a lot of our other countries at that particular point in time, like January, February, we're in real lockdown. I mean, pools were closed. People couldn't move around. I was out in California and it was, it was a complete mess. And, and it seemed like at that point in time, you did something super intelligent by pulling people together, pulling the whole team together, having team meetings, having these event camps or whatever you called them. And it seemed like you guys had a jump start on the whole world, really. Yeah, look, probably, um, you know, five or six months before that, we, we felt that the way that things were going, we would have an opportunity to bring everyone together. And we felt that was, you know, just, just like anything, being being in lockdown and being separated from your friends and family, that just that con reconnection was important. And then we started focusing, once we started realizing it was going to happen, we started talking about, well, what are we, what is the theme of this? What are we actually, you know, it's one thing to bring them together, just let them train, but What's the purpose behind it, and what's what can we what can we use this for um, in the preparation for for the Tokyo Games, and um, and and that that became the real theme is what do we want our team to 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 look like? How do we want them to um, um, you know to be able to operate within within a, an environment that we had absolutely zero uh, idea of what it was going to look like? We were we were really guessing, so we. You know, I, I was meeting with athlete leaders fortnightly, talking to them about ideas, meeting with the coaches, and generally just kind of getting um, ideas around, um, you know, how we could create uh, a, a bonding type of environment, I guess you could say, as, and, and, and it really was around behaviors. Um, but also I wanted to, to hide some things from the athletes and, you know, and, and, and spring some things on them because – we knew that was going to happen. We knew we were going to we were going to run into things that were, um, as we know, the Olympics. Any normal Olympic games will provide, uh, particularly to what we had twenty one debutantes at Olympic Games. Um, you know, they're going to come into things they've never seen before in their life, and uh, we just wanted to have a bit of fun with it. Uh, we wanted them to to bond through creating the teams in, in the teams activity. Um, but we, as you know, hockey being, you know, growing up through the nineties, the event camps are, are a special environment, um, that, that I think was the strength of ours in the late nineties into 2000. Um, we, we did continue those, but we drifted away there for a little bit. Um, and I think it's something that, um, just proved that it, it's value in, in, in the fact that <clears throat> swimming to me, swimming Australia is a big swimming club. And, you know, I just, I just looked at it the way I ran my, my swimming clubs is, you got to keep everybody together as often as possible. Let them build those relationships, whether they like each other or not, is irrelevant. It's about respect and, and understanding what each other's purpose is. And event camps are a way of of finding out who's who's training the best. And for you as a coach and for you as an athlete, they're also an opportunity to to reset what you're doing at home and understand. But I think the biggest lesson we learned was, um, you know, what kind of work do we need to be really doing? I think. Everybody got lost in that 15 months of what training should we be doing, you know? Um, we would meet fortnightly as a coaching group and talk about, you know, 
Do we create a competition like a virtual time trial? Does people need to race right now? Because you're, you know, there's lots of things, but the, the, the event camp was kind of like the, the pinnacle of, 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 of all those activities we did preceding it. Well, look, just as an outsider looking in from, from what I can tell, and just knowing you and knowing the people that are working around you, it, it seems in the past that part of the struggles with the Australian swim team has been some sort of lack of trust in, in leadership. And, and it seems like with you, we now finally have a leader that everybody's trusting. From, and again, this is from the outside looking in, knowing the people in, in place here. It seems like there is a, a great amount of trust in who you are and the philosophies you bring and and the leadership that you bring. And and honestly, it's shown up in the results, mate. I mean, they're calling this the most successful Australian swim team in history. And you got to feel proud to be leading that right now, right? Oh, very proud. And uh, I think for me, um, I trust them. I think that's the biggest important piece for me is – I really trust the coaches and athletes and until they, and that's just my personality, until someone burns me, um, I trust you. So I empower you and um, I make sure that, that I, I give you what you need to, to, um, to succeed. As a coach on pool deck, clearly I had a bit more of a directive um, in that space where, you know, I, I would, uh, um, you know, guide and, and guide and lead the coach, the athlete, excuse me, a little bit more. But but the older athletes I coached, um, you know, I wanted them, I wanted to trust them and to give me the proper feedback, not just on me as in what the program was being delivered, but, but also me as a coach and how I was being consistent enough for them to provide them, you know, an, an environment where they they could they could do what they do best, and I think so. I think that for me, I, I just trusted everybody in that on that team, um, and I hopefully in return, it, and it, and that came that way that they felt comfortable that they could they could come to me. Um, you know, I made it my my number one priority to acknowledge everybody as as I got to the pool. Um, you know, and, and but not over the top. It, it's really just a general. It's just generally how I operate. Um, and and empower the coaches. These are, I got I, you know I'm not stating any. There's great coaches around the world, and I respect so many of them. But but the group of coaches that we have, um, you know, the Michael Balls as you've interviewed, and the and the Simon Cusacks, and some of these coaches. I mean, they they've coached multiple gold medalists at Olympic Games. Not many people do that. Mm. These 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 people are exceptionally gifted at what they do. You mm -hmm. just got to get out of the way and give them what they need. And if they ask for things. You try to get it for them, mm -hmm. and I think that's a simple formula for me. Well, mate, a year ago you did mention that it was a, a one-year contract, so the big question now would be, is this going to be uh, a continued thing for you? Are we going to Paris as the Australian head coach? Well, I'm hoping so. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm in quarantine. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I have nothing definitive yet, but there's definitely my interest is to continue on. Um as you know, Alex Bauman, unfortunately, is is not well and is stepping down as CEO, and I report directly to him. So we're working through some things, um, and, you know, there's more priorities at stake with him at the moment, and uh, and I respect that. But for me, I've made it very clear that I want to continue. So whatever the process is for them, if it's, a, you know, an open process of advertise and, and, and apply, I'll do that um, or whatever. So but – I can tell you, I can assure you I'd like to be in Paris. That's yeah, true. well, listen, if it's an open process, it would be a disgrace at this stage. I mean, like I said, the most successful swim team in history, everybody seems like um, they're thriving under your leadership. You're doing a great job with it. So I hope that they just do the right thing and give you the contract uh, up front, you know. So, um, you know, what do you do now? And just in terms for you, what, what do you get a break now? Well, unfortunately, um, well, we're in quarantine, but, you know, there's a lot going on with um, we're a year into the cycle. Um, we've been working on um, what is what is 22 look like, 23, you know, 24. We've been doing that prior to this. Um, and now um, we're, we're just so there's quite a, like Tamara Shepard, who is our uh, Olympic team managers, the high performance the lead a high performance as well. So we're having meetings virtually, even though we're in the same facility um, with others that are back home, just ensuring that we're setting ourselves up 
that uh, we can get our calendar set. So a really important piece is what does our calendar look like? And when I talk about that, I'm talking about, you know, domestic competitions at the moment, international competitions for us are, you know, quarantine when we come home until that changes. We're really limited to the benchmark meets, so Worlds in May and Commonwealth Games in August, um, maybe uni games if that goes ahead. And, uh, and I think there's a junior Worlds next year. So we're looking at lining up the trials, which, which will be, uh, we're looking at April. Um, that'll probably be a trials for both Worlds and Com Games. Um, and then we'll have some sort of competition in between to try to fill the gaps if we need to. But we just need to bed that calendar down and then meet with the coaches. We'll have our coaches. That's one of the things I've brought. What, what I wanted to bring back was um, uh, regular coaches catch ups with our performance coaches. So twice a year we fly into a location, not a swimming event separate to that. And we just do planning. We do we discuss all of the key things that we need to do. So our first one will be in September. Um, and that's where we'll sit down and say, this is what the Paris plan looks like. And this is what we're, we're doing. And they can then have input as to what they want to do within that plan. So that some of them might want to travel to, like we've been doing domestic camps, obviously, but some might want to go and do Mount Ostrom at one point or a West Coast tour or, you know, th these types of things, as you know, World Cups, whatever, there's ISL happening. So there's so many factors we just need to bed down what our what are our key benchmark meets, what are where our trials are, and where our camps are, and then our domestic competitions. That's our calendar, and then we present to the to the to the 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 the, 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 the group of high performance coaches that we work with. It's about twenty of them that uh, um, we work with, and then uh, yeah, from there we we just hit the ground running and we start funding. Um, their, their their programs to make sure they can deliver what the what they've done this 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 uh, this time around and uh, we've got a simple formula um, and Jocko impl implemented it so I've I've just taken it taking that formula and just carrying it forward and shaping it with my own my own fingerprints but in in short you know we're we're just trying to invest in coaches and athletes as much as we can so they can train and prepare. Well, it's interesting that you say that in terms of um, investing in coaches. You know, the, the athletes seem to get a lot of the spotlight in Australia, and, and deservedly so. They're, they're the ones out there doing the performances. But like you said, you have some of the most amazing coaches in the world. How do you feel like it compares in terms of the, the pay scale with, with the rest of the world, in terms of what some of your top coaches are making, and, and how can that, if it needs to be, how, how does that come up for them? Firstly, I think Dane Boxel is probably more famous than any swimmer at the moment. <laughs> he the should world. be. He's buddy. He's buddy. Uh, yeah, he definitely put himself on the map. But uh, no, it's something we're working on. Like, we're not really sure what the – like, obviously, this collegiate uh, mm -hmm. salary. I, I'm not – I honestly have no real clue of what some baseline salary should be. We definitely know that we want to get our, our coaches better um, – better re remunerated um, and and have the better resources and sometimes Brad it's not about just their pay it's it's getting a full-time assistant coach I can tell you right now that Vince Rowley coached Olympic gold medalist did not have an assistant coach he used three different coaches including his wife to cover sessions when he couldn't make it um, local people because we just can't we just didn't have the resources to, to, to put in an assistant coach um, there was a number of coaches on our team who, who who lack having a full-time assistant. So they're running performance programs with, and so resourcing them, number one priority is, is getting their pay, their pay remuneration to where it should be. We, we're looking at that. Secondly, um, it's getting full-time assistants. And, and that's aspiring coaches who want to become high performance coaches. That's, that's coaches who say, Hey, listen, in the next 10, to, you know, by 2032, I want to be in a position to make, to make the national team. Um, and we want we want to put them in an environment where they can actually learn on the, on the go. So we we've got some work we're doing. I mean, getting twenty thirty two has definitely been beneficial to us because um, you know there's going to be additional resources. So we work with the state institutes and academies, as as you know that system down here. Um, working with them about where they can help us, um, and and it could be in employment of assistant coaches. 
um, and 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 those types of things. But we definitely need to get better at that um, yeah. because, as you know, you need you need good people around you, and uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, listen, in terms of just the uh, the baseline infrastructure amount, you know, I, c- I can give you an idea there as well. But a lot of that stuff is just public knowledge, uh, public uh, availability. You know, a lot of these guys in America work at public universities, and you just do a simple, yeah. simple internet search to see how much Eddie Reese is getting paid or something like that, and it, and it's it's a lot of money. And and so I certainly do hope that a lot of your top coaches, like the Dean Boxels and the Michael Bowles and the Simon Cusacks do end up um, matching up with that pay scale. They they deserve it, mate. They've done a fantastic yeah. job. Well, it, it is definitely a shift for us in the last. Probably Jocko drove it coming in, pointing out that without the coaches, you know, creating the environment, the athletes don't have a place to um, to to really develop their their skill sets and 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 be be in a position to perform it's it's a partnership that 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 is is absolutely you know unbreakable and we need to invest in both of those and so um we've cut through now and and i think it's become a clear strategy for swimming australia like it's always been a strategy in high performance but i'm talking about an overall strategy um and it's just a matter as you know brad i mean i think we're, we're our swimming history is different. Our swimming history in Australia is born out of learn to swim being kind of like the Forbes Carlisle would run a learn to swim school at, at, at the pool on the weekend and would coach, you know, coach kids and the parents would kind of all chip in and pay. And there's always been this sense of the coach is just kind of, uh, you know, there to, you know, not, not, it, I wouldn't say amateur, but the professionalism of how we're seen. Is uh, is something that's evolving and and catching up, and with that comes a remuneration piece, which, which as as you're stating, I'm hoping that it gets to the point where we're where we're on par with what others are doing. But you know, the collegiate system also has, and those coaches deserve exactly what they get. The collegiate system has a different mechanism um, of how they generate revenue, and but uh, for us, where it is a priority, and um, you know, I'm 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 making it my priority. To, to 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 make sure those coaches are, are supported in, in every way possible good stuff man appreciate that i'm sure they do too so you talked about well, you mentioned dean box a little bit there and you know the he is, he is famous right now you know the the whole world has seen first of all what his athlete did uh you know in, in taking down an olympic legend um and and winning a couple of gold medals of self Ariane titmus uh, in the 200 400 free and then um, and then the way that Dean kind of performed, you know, in front of the, the camera. I don't think he knew there was a camera on him, but there was, and it, it ended up going worldwide. But what don't we know about Dean? What What are the things that you see? Obviously, he's put in years of work to get that result, um, and it seems like in some way he's being a little bit misunderstood. So as the head coach, what are you seeing in him that he's doing really well that really needs to be driven home publicly? Well, firstly, I think his behavior or what we call his, his, his exuberance and his celebration of his athletes' performances is well known. It's not a secret. He does it at local level. He, he, when his kids achieve something, um, he celebrates. Obviously, that was a, a, a probably beyond – he admits he lost it a bit um, because it was, it, was, it, was, it was an epic – uh, success and it was planned and it was executed to the to the T. Um, so from a from a perspective of him locally at a local state Queensland State Championships, he runs up and down the pool. He swings his arm. He's always doing things like that. It's that's his personality. On deck coaching. What what you need to know is this guy is an exceptional, detailed, um, driven coach. That I love going to his program and watching him coach. So my role. I'm fortunate. I basically am employed during the not during when campaigns not on. I travel to every of all the performance coaches programs, so I rotate around. So I'd probably be at his session every third week on a Monday afternoon, and be there on deck. He 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 gives me a stopwatch. Well, I have my own, but he he always tells me I don't know how to use it. But anyway, he says I need you to time that lane, and he gives me something to do, and I get to watch him at work with his whole squad. And he is he is across everybody so that in detail his session presentation he writes it up he talks to his group he gives them the detail 
And then during the training session, he might be working with the middle distance group, but the sprinters are over here and, you know, form strokers or he's got them split up into groups. He's got Maxie, who's his assistant coach who works with him. Um, but he, he, he specifically keeps talking to all the athletes during the main training sets and he's got connection with every single one of them, passion with every single one of them as equal as it is to Ariane. And, uh, He's a very well planned, very well detailed, um, very knowledgeable uh, person. Um, uh, you know, if you want, if you don't want to get into a, a guessing game with him about movies or songs or anything like that, he loves loves playing music and getting you to guess the band and the song and <laughs> play with him. He's he's very 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 clever. But I, what I would say is, in coaching terms, the guy is one of the hardest working coaches I know. Um, he's out of the Michael Ball school as in Mick Palfrey is. They both worked under Bowley. Um, he also worked under Stefan Wid Vidmar. So he's had world class coaches uh, that have that have mentored him and still do. And the one thing Dean is is very humble. He will come to you and he will ask your advice on things. He is not a know all. He's very much he wants to know what I think. He wants my feedback on technique. Uh, he'll ask me to work with some of his breaststrokers, for instance, and ask me about the technique. Or he, he's very humble and he very much wants to learn. Um, and he, uh, he's, uh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't speak highly enough of, of his coaching. And, um, and, yeah, you know, like his celebrations were, were, were an example of how we all felt, to be perfectly honest. But we just, we just don't express ourselves that way. Yeah, mate. Listen, I did a live show at the same time that the 400 was going on. I was I was commentating in America, and I wasn't that far off what Dean did. And I'm not coaching her, so like, um, I was pretty expressive myself. But uh, yeah, you got a winner there, mate, and you got to keep him. He he's awesome. So yeah, we got to look after him, and I think that's a big T is is me mm -hmm. talking to him about his balance and mm -hmm. and just finding that balance because mm -hmm. you know you can only go. Um, 100 miles an hour for so long mm. you know you've got to as you know as a coach you've got to find um you've got to find a way to um to balance yourself and and i think that's his next step for him as a coach he's achieved a, a, a an exceptional result like he's climbed mount everest as he said i think on i think he said to an australian journal they said what's next for arnie and he said well she can't represent Earth and race against Mars, so she's pretty much achieved the, the highest standard possible. And I thought that was a pretty good statement because, you know, she can only repeat is the only thing she can do now, and uh, mm -hmm. that's a challenge for any any athlete. And uh, yeah, so but look, all the coaches on this team, I have to say, they're all got characters in their own right. They're all very, um, you know, exceptional um, people, but but really fun to be around. Like just. We got a lot of we got a lot of time together through COVID. We spent a lot of time. We were three weeks in camp before we went to Tokyo, and we, you know we just spent a lot of time together. And and uh, they've all got their quirks, and we all we all uh, enjoy each other's company. Well, in terms of strengths and weaknesses, when when you look at the results, I'm looking down the results here. I wrote them out actually, and it, the women's team were exceptional. Obviously, I mean winning yeah. multiple medals across the board. Uh, the men did well, but was there is there any fear that the the women are, are way above where the men are, or how are you feeling in terms of the balance of of your team moving forward? Yeah, look, I just see opportunities, uh, Brett, and and it's, and and it's now the challenge to the coaches in in, in Australia. I've had a couple already um, pod webinars with coaches through the coaches association, and my challenge to them is. You know, uh, I coached Travis Monty in Rio to seventh in the 400 I am. When I was coaching at Nutter Wadding, Brendan Smith was a young 15-year-old, I think, at the time. And I used to bring Brendan over and train with Travi two times a week in Travis's quality set. And I'd send Brendan off 10 seconds in front of Travis. And I just, Travis would ch chase Brendan. And I used to tell Brendan, this is what, this is what it looks like to, to train at that level. And then Scott Talbot came in and, and took Brendan over and realized I've got something here and started working with him. And uh, and then what happened was there was a collection of male athletes in that Nutter Wadding squad that that trained together with Scott. Scott brought that group together and Wayne Laws carried that group through. 
So my point is, is that there was an opportunity in the 400 IM. Scott Talbot started pointing Brendan in that direction. Coaches need to actually start seeing where the opportunities lie and actually going out and actually training and learning and spending time understanding what it takes. We, we've got, we've got, you know, Zach Stubbley Cook saved us by going a 58 six in the, in the breaststroke split in the, med, in the uh, mixed medley. Um, you know, that was well beyond what we, 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 we on paper was 59 three based on his double O um, we need flat start 58 flat boys. Um, there's an opportunity. So to, to answer your question, our men have huge opportunities and we need our coaches to, to really start looking at um, identifying through our talent programs and getting them together and telling them what the standard is and, and, then, and then educating our coaches that, that have those athletes who aren't already world-class coaches to, um, to, bring, to bring them together a little bit more often and challenge each other. It's real easy for them to swim in their home programs by themselves. And as you know, when you're training by yourself in your home program, you, you think you're going well, but it's not until you come up against an, an, another big dog that might smack you around a little bit. You get a wake up call, and that's what event camps are about. Um, so, I think we can grow in that area. And I think the women's program, um, we've got a lot of youth, um, and we we have a. There were missed opportunities as well. You know, we you know I'll talk about it now because I get asked every time. Our four by two relay strategy was a strategy we used in Beijing, on paper, and we use we're working with a system. We, we we knew our girls knew they were swimming the heats. They knew that was all their role was, and we had backed in the team. We had a strategy of getting out, getting a lead, getting a lead, and then holding it. That didn't happen. Um, but we broke a world record, got a bronze medal. Shit, that stuff happens, and we know. Looking back, we can sit here and say we could have, should have, would have. Everybody's a Monday quarterback. But our strategy that we went in with was to win, and it didn't happen. But um, our girls that swam that relay, um, they've copped a lot on social media. And some of those young girls um, are really, it's really, it's its unfair. It's absolutely unfair. We back them in and we still back them in. And I, and I just want to say that the coaches made, made a decision. I made a decision and I still back it in. Whether people agree with it or not, that's their opinion. But uh, leave the kids out of it because they, they, they swam their hearts out. And, um, and they got a world record and a bronze medal. And we didn't know China was going to be so good. And the Americans stood up as they always do. So that's my say on the four by two. What's yeah, well, on? mate, listen, the number one team in the world, the U.S., came away with 30 medals. Their, their coaches made some errors. You know, they, they had a couple of relays where, you know, their kids were getting killed on social media. Uh, you know, it's and, unfair and, to go after yeah. the athlete. It's just yeah. absolutely wrong. These mm. people are human beings. Mm -hmm. They make mistakes. They can swim well. They're great. Doesn't mean they're great human beings when they swim well. They could be. It doesn't mean they're not great human beings when they don't swim well. Mm -hmm. And for me, I had to have conversations and assure those young ladies that they that we back them in, and that's why we back them in. And and sometimes it doesn't go your way. That's the lessons of as you know, Brett, very well. The Olympics is hardcore. Yep. Unless you've been in that in that environment, I don't think you you really know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, it's it's cutthroat, and you know, even Caleb Dressel talked about the stress that he was under the yeah. the you know the eight days of the games, and so oh, unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all there, mate. So yeah, and look, I don't I don't blame the athletes at all for for that. It, it comes down to a race. You got to race the race. You know, you can't just hand out medals. You got to race the race. So um, I'm. I'm I'm happy to cop the criticism for strategy, but I can back. I can tell you, we went in with a strategy, and but we also went in with a strategy with the mixed medley, and it paid off because mm -hmm. uh, that was our best team, and our our athletes put their hands up and said, "I'll back up off of finals because we want to. We, we think we can win a medal. Um, we could have. We could have rested them. They didn't want it. Um, we we knew Britain would would. We thought Britain and would win, and then. We thought we could get a minor medal, and it came off, and it did. So that strategy works. So you know, it goes, it goes, it has swings and roundabouts, as you know. As the head coach, do you have veto power over the decision making when it comes to the relays? Yeah, my my decisions are, are the final decisions. I right. sign off. I, I sign the document. 
Um, we have uh, a very thorough, long process that starts uh, probably well before the staging camp. Staging camp, we meet and we we start talking to the relay, the designated relay coach about what are you thinking, what is your strategy, what are you thinking your strategy might be, and why, and we challenge that. And as we know, as a lot of it's all about performance and things in competition. Um, and uh, we, as we go through that, we invite the other coaches in to challenge that. So mm -hmm. everybody's involved. And this is something that's evolved from times that have gone by where, you know, people have, you know, accused the coaches or say accused or question whether it's transparent enough and that, you know, it seems like d decisions are made without people knowing. The next step is that the, the athletes are informed of the evolving strategy. We tell them as soon as we can that, you know, sometimes a strategy like the medley relay is, listen, we're not going to know who the heat team and the, and the final team is until we get to day six. Hmm. Be prepared. Uh, you know, we, we, we wanted to swim a, a, a female breaststroker, for instance. Uh, we just couldn't. It, it just didn't add up. We couldn't take the risk. And it worked out where we didn't, and we swam our breaststroker twice. But we, our goal was always to try to have, because of the knowing and experiencing Beijing with morning finals being really tough. And if you look at semis off the back of the heats and even finals, like people were struggling to back up and getting home after uh, getting home late. And you know, if you've had yeah you know, the, the adrenaline and getting to sleep and then having to get up the next morning and trying to back up. You know, you had to you had to think about it strategically. But back to the coaching piece, we worked through that, and the the whole idea was to to inform the the athletes as as soon as we could, so they were aware and prepared, um, without also at times locking yourself into um, locking yourself into things that needed to change at last minute. And mm. you know, and there were were times where it was impossible to make changes because w w where we were at was just too, was too late. Um, and that's what I think, um, you know, a, a, an evening heats and a morning finals really does put you in that position sometimes because it's just a little bit too late to make changes. Um, and uh, but but that's our process. Um, mm. it, it, it's it's a thorough one. But at the end of the day, when a relay is put in front of me, I say that's the one I think we go with. And mixed medley, uh, as an example, we had. Two, two, one clear option, which was the one we went with, which was the best option as far as on paper. We had a second option, which would have really mixed it up a bit, um, but it was uh, was was decent. And the third one was a no. And I said, let me go talk to the coaches and the athletes of the first option, and if they're comfortable, that's the one we're going with. And that's mm. basically how it came down to it. Right. Mate, out of all the medalists you have, was is there anyone who's definitively come out and said that Tokyo was it for them, or do you feel like all of them will continue to swim? Uh, none, none have come out and said to, to me that yep. they're done. No, okay. I haven't had any conversations. No. Well, that's good. It's exciting. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's and we've got some talent coming through, and you mm. know, look, we we have. Uh, We've set a high high bar, and um, we, and we, and we've always strived for a high bar, Brett. As you know, you've been, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, my personal goal is to um, is to continue to keep the standards high and expectations of what we can achieve, and not be not be shy about it, not 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 you know try to downplay it. Um, we 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 want to be the best um, at what we do. We want to take we want to take on the best in every event. There's all kinds of. We're not just talking countries. I'm talking events, um, and uh, and we want our athletes to feel like they're prepared to do that. And um, the you know if they don't, they don't, and that's just the way it is. But we want to do our. We want to do that. And you know if, if I if 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 I'm not going to stand in front of any um, you know media and say that oh you know if we can you know if we can go okay like I said to the media. When, before this meet, they would ask how many medals. It was always about medals. How many medals do you think you're going to get, and or, or do you want to get? I said as many as we can, and mm. that's exactly it. That's my answer: as many as we can get. I'm, I'm not going to say no to. We're going to get as many as we can get, and we're, we're going to go in every competition with a team, and we're going to try to get as many as many medals as we can get. 
We're very strong about relays. I've been very clear that relays are an absolute um, priority for us as a country. It, it, it shows strength. It gives us depth. Um, we, you know that mm -hmm. that was a strategy that was brought in during your time swimming. Yeah, and I think it definitely bolstered and created some momentum for for the Australian teams into 2000. And I think it's a no it's a no brainer. Mate, what are the commonalities that you can draw between, let's say, the Olympic gold medalists on your team, the ones that come come away with gold medals? I mean, it, it's very, very difficult to win a gold medal in Olympics, but you you guys have had, um, you know, the guys and the girls win them. Is there a is there a commonality between the gold medalists, particularly, that you can see that that they all do that really well? Probably um, no. It's a very inter it's a very interesting question. I got asked that question by a young ten year old on a webinar last night. Um, mm. Said, "What is it that makes the gold medalist different than everybody else?" And mm. um, I think it's that one one their the competitive IQ is is really important. That is that they just they want to win. You know, uh, Susie O'Neill spoke into our team. Um, and uh, and was was in 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 Tokyo with us, but she she said every time she got on the block, she believed she could win. Um, it didn't mean that she wasn't nervous and shitting herself. It didn't mean anything like that. But I think it's first their belief that they can they can that they can they want to win. They just want to they want to be a winner. Two, they know how to manage the nerves and use those to their advantage. They don't let the nerves overcome their. Their, mm -hmm. their process and their race plan. I think those are probably the two things that I think are in common with those athletes. Uh, very different outward people. Um, you know, um, I remember I've told this story before. I should have told you before you talked to Bali because he could have told you the story. But, you know, before the 200 IM in Beijing, uh, Liesl Jones, I had Liesl swimming the 100 breast, so I had my own athlete about to hopefully achieve a, a great outcome and, I see Bowley talking to Steph Rice and she's in tears, like absolute. And she's 20 minutes away from racing the 200 IM final. And I've gone, oh my God, what's going on here? So he comes and sits next to me in the stands and we're sitting there to watch finals. And he says, he said, oh my God. He said, oh. And I said, what's going on? Oh, she's just, she just needs to let it out. She needs to let me know she's nervous. She needs to just, I just have to sit there and listen. So I think, again, just, as an example, I think sometimes athletes just need to share with someone they trust, hey, I'm not I'm I'm nervous. And then that person says, It's okay. That's what you're supposed to be, and just go off and do your job. And and he's he was going, Oh, this could be a disaster. And she breaks a world record and wins a gold medal. So it goes <laughs> to show you that everyone processes it differently. Mm -hmm. But being nervous and wanting to win are the two key things. So um, you know, we all call holding your nerve. I think it's 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 capturing it and using it and making it and actually understanding what nervousness is. Mm -hmm. It's it's body preparing for battle. That's mm -hmm. what it is. It's mm -hmm. like you're getting ready for battle. So actually, your mindset should attach itself to the nervousness, as in I'm going into battle. And I think those that that do that well. And I'd say that would be the common thing. I mean, you know, yeah. Zach Lee Cook, who I think you, I don't know, he's been interviewed somewhere, but uh, yeah. and Zach, Zach, he's just a, you know, you, if you walk, you'd walk past him in the street, you wouldn't even, you would just wouldn't, he wouldn't even come out at you, but he is just a very, very uh, determined young man who uh, holds his nerve very well. But uh, I think he knew he was going to win that race a long time before if he did everything right, like mm. he felt he was capable of. Right. Never said it to me, but he acted and trained that way. Yeah. So that's what I saw. Yeah, that's good. Good information for people. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, a little bit of a surprise before the Olympics. Got some news come out about a, a pro league going on in Australia. What kind of information can you share with us about that? So we were approached um, – Oh, this look. This is probably a couple of years ago. In fact, it all started with trying to get uh, ISL to be um, have have Australia as one of its destinations, as a as one of its, I guess, um, clusters. Mm. That was probably where it all started. Um, and then COVID hit, 
because there was going to be, I think there was going to be, or there was, there was discussion. Um, COVID hit, and then the group that was looking to to do that, they're involved with um, uh, professional basketball and others. They they basically said to Swimming Australia, and myself, um, is there a desire for for some sort of domestic professional league? We said absolutely, because you I don't know if you remember swimming in the National League in the late nineties. You remember swimming in yeah. that league? Yeah. yeah so. We had this, 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 the National League back then, which was something Talbot put in place. And I said, shit, you know, hey, if you're prepared to fund it, um, absolutely, we, we need we need some sort of domestic racing opportunity that's short, sharp, and fast that uh, um, gives our athletes a chance to, to race in training during training. Um, and, uh, and they said, um, yeah, we, we want to do that. So they, they formed a partnership with Swimming Australia, which is – to deliver the product and work with us from a technical point of view. Um, so basically a- after the Olympics, so right now I'm, I'm going to start working with them um, and our coaches because the coaches are the key to, um, to shaping something within our calendar that allows us to um, have our, our, not only our, our big hitters, but our up and comers and, um, Race regularly over a short period of time, um, in a short form, short format, um, and uh, and unique. And they're going to do some unique things because these people are commercially minded. They 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 know that just your basic swim meet, other than the Olympic trials and Olympics, it doesn't get viewership. So there's going to be some unique things in there. I don't know what they've come up with, but they that that's my next when I get out of lockdown. That'll be my next thing. But in short, it's going to be. You know, uh, something that by 2023, we should have a, you know, a, a, a league that will run somewhere between two and four weeks, depending on how much the coaches are willing to give up. Uh, likely, um, you know, there'll be, I think, to say what the ISL is doing and has brought to Australians is teams, racing in teams format, racing for points. Um, and having that that kind of connection, social connection, obviously, and and, and dollars. Um, what we want to use it for is to create a feeder system into that league. So this is not to be in comp- competition. This is a feeder system. Mm, um, right, for our young- right. And and the biggest thing, Brett, for me is it's got to agitate and influence down into our sport because th- those that live in Australia know. If you're a parent, um, you take your kid to the local, you know, Chandler or the big pools, and they swim their first race at 9 a.m., their second race at 11, the third mm. race at 30, and their fourth race at 4 p.m., mm. and you sit there all day to watch them swim a club meet. And it's all about, like, no, no, we want these – we want clubs being able to go – pick four other clubs and say, let's meet up and run a meet. We're going to do it over two hours. They're going to do those four races in 35 minutes or 40 minutes or 50 minutes. They're going to race for points. They're going to do relaysing, and we're going to go home. We'll have a sausage sizzle. We'll go home, and everybody's happy. Mm. That's why my kids play basketball, but they don't swim because I can go watch it, and I can be home. It's all done within an hour and a half. Right. Um, And that's why I'm hoping it bridges the gap between what the ISL is trying to achieve and what we need to happen competitively. So I'm all in to, to see it become something uh, successful. I got asked by quite a lot, just I'll, I'll say this on, 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 on your show, but I got asked by quite a few coaches over in, in, in uh, Tokyo, will, oh, will internationals be part of this? Will internationals be part of this? I think uh, if the opportunity presents itself down the track, I definitely think that you know, if you if you look at the like a, the IPL model or the, mm. or the the cricket type model where you have, or even international basketball where you have like um, uh, spots for imports, I, I definitely think that's something that could be uh, and should be looked at. But make no mistake, this is this is separate to ISL. This is not. This is something for us to do domestically. And if we could bring in big hitters who want to come down and do a camp in Australia and race for a few weeks. And they can be in a team. Absolutely, I would be. I would love to see that happen. Um, but it, we're probably a few years away from that because we just got to get the product right. Yeah, 
I mean, it sounds awesome. I, I like the idea of more racing. Um, it kind of goes against what Australia is used to, really, because it's it's used to more big training blocks because of the the lack of competition. And so, it's, I think it will be a shift for coaches, for sure. How does it how does it not compete with the ISL though? Like, are you planning around the ISL season, or, or are you really not looking at it? You're just looking at when does it suit us, and if it's during the ISL season, that's the way it is. Like how how does it work together? Well, ultimately, number one, we want we would like it to operate outside of ISL, depending. But we need to know what they're doing. Like you know, the more in, in advance we know. So the first to answer your first question, it's outside. But we do understand that um, there may be crossover, and those big those big hitters who do ISL will will not be there. But we'll still have a league going for our mm. under athletes who aren't in ISL. And there'll be opportunities for our, our top age group swimmers. And, and you know, Brett, our top age group swimmers, the ones that win at national age, they're the ones that you saw on the dais, the Ariane Titmus, the Kaylee McEwens, the, mm. the Emma McKeans, the Carl Chalmers, the Zach Stubbley Cook, 14 years old, broke the Australian record in the 200 breaststroke. We're, we know that they're, we know who they are when they're young. We need to give them more racing opportunities. And, and for me, growing up in the States, you know, I went through high school and, and, and college racing and the amount of meaningful race starts I got as a swimmer compared to what what I would have gotten as an athlete in Australia is it's chalk and cheese. Um, Gennady Tereski used to say to me, we only prepare our age group swimmers to swim fast once a year, national age, and that's it. And and I always thought about that, like, yeah, we, we really don't put our kids under pressure to compete enough. Um, so we need to just create ways to do it. And that's something that I think um, – you know, I look forward to, and, I, and and it's definitely a, it's definitely what we all want. It's not about tapering for those events. It's about racing and training, yeah. um, learning how to compete. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I think that's key, and that that's definitely something that is lacking. In terms of um, just, I know I've kept you a while, but I appreciate your time. Um, do you have to run at any point soon? Uh, I'm in quarantine, mate. I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. All right. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, a couple of years back, I, I was fortunate enough to be invited down to talk about this double peaking periodization, you know, the time between, you know, what, what the U.S. were doing kind of in, in a collegiate system and a, and a U.S. system where, you know, you have your trials and then four or five weeks later you have your games and you guys were looking at changing that and you've gone to this shift um, just recently how have you felt like it's gone? Is this something that you want to continue in the future? Um, it's part of our review um, at the moment to see what the what the coaches feel. Um, I think, um, you know, COVID was a very different environment for us to, to really compare it. I, I've always been a fan of it, to be honest, Brett. I've always been one pushing for it for, for 20 years. Um, and, and getting howled down by the tradition, the older coaches. Um, so I'm a big fan of it because I believe what it allowed us to do is to stay together. Um, we went straight into Queensland. They were straight into preparing. We got into camp early. So from a team building point of view and, and a training focus point of view, I think it definitely helped. I think the big thing for us is um, <clears throat> is the fact that having done it as an athlete in the States, I never doubted that I would – I never doubted that I wouldn't swim quicker in the second meet. I always, it was more of like, and I, I remember Frank Bush saying it was, it was more about belief than, than anything. You just, you just, you know, just do the training. Um, we're very scientifically driven in this country about training. And I think, you know, it's a bit of a balance between the two. We, we can get better at it. So for my, my, my simple answer to you is I'd like to keep going with it and I'd like to just look at it uh, if, uh, and, and just, see if we can make it better. We're going to have to do it next year because we've got a May Worlds. We've got a Commonwealth Games. We're going to have to do a short trials. Um, so we're going to have to get it out of the way. Worlds in 23, as I understand, is in November. So there's a long time, like we're talking about a whole year before a trials meet. So we're going to have to look at Nash, you know, how, what meets we put on and how we create competition. But simple, simple answer is, is I think a short trials meet has a lot more benefits and a lot less um, problems than uh, a longer trials. And if Don Tarbot was was probably alive and God bless his soul, 
he probably would rip me, ring me up and rip me up for saying it. But <laughs> I think, um, you know, giving 16 to 18 weeks to be an, you know, particularly an Olympian, to be an Olympian for 16 to 18 weeks when you're actually not an Olympian until you step foot on the on the AOC's mm. turf um, can, can get distracting. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and athletes can get complacent and coaches can get complacent in this in this space i think we we, we keep everybody on the right track momentum wise um, we need to look at how our distance swimmers how we how we help them we need to look at that um, and understand that a bit better but the coaches feedback will be what i'll be looking for that'll be that'll drive me to to to, to look at it even closer yeah, for sure. Well, listen, mate, uh, Ariane Titmus and Jack McLaughlin handled it pretty well, you know, so um, no complaints out of them, I wouldn't think. But uh, to me, it looked like they just had more confidence at the games. You know, they just raced, you know, four or five weeks earlier. They'd come off of great trials. They'd all swum really fast. There was a lot of questions over in America of like, well, you know, Australia never backs up. Australia never does what they did on home soil and here we are you know you guys have an outstanding olympics people um winning multiple medals swimming best times um you know crushing it so to me it it seems like you guys are onto something and um you know from the athlete's point of view it looked like they had a lot of confidence as far as i could tell so i would it's interesting brett you know like um people forget beijing athens sydney but we're pretty good teams then and can i just say statistically and Jocko brought this to my attention that um, before Sydney, Australia never finished better than fifth, I believe. And I, I'm happy to be wrong here, but we were always fifth, sixth, seventh on, on the medal tally in swimming uh, and Olympics all previously to that. It was only Sydney where we arrived at number two. And then we we're number two in uh, Athens, number two in Beijing. I think we went to number seven in and on London, which which we know wasn't right. So London and then Rio were back to number two as far as where we sat. Now we we but we had a great Beijing Olympics. That was the most medals we'd won up until this Olympics as far as total medals, and we had six gold. We won every a medal in every relay. So we, we've only had a patch where we've really we really un, underperformed as as to the expectations mm. as a nation. For 20 years, we've, 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 we've been doing a lot of right things. And I want to make it clear that, you know, we're not, we haven't, we're not underperformed for 100 years and then all of a sudden we've come out. We've, we've actually been pretty bloody good. You're on the Sydney and team, the Athens team. You're on two of the most successful teams, um, as well as, uh, you know, Beijing was, was, was a fantastic team that I was on and a part of. And London and Rio were, 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 weren't, weren't good meets. We but we've, 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 we've steered it back towards the right direction and we want to maintain it. But, you know, to say that, that we always choke is forgetting about Beijing, forgetting about Athens and forgetting about Sydney because that didn't happen there. Yeah. I'd like to see you fired up, mate. Um, it's, it's that recency, you know, like it's always like, what have you done lately kind of exactly. thing. And I, and I understand that. And like, it's, it's, it, to me, it's, it doesn't affect me. It's just, it's just, it, it, it motivates me because, I know the facts, and but you know, to your point, you're you're reflecting what what external people are, mm-hmm. are saying, and I'm 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 going back and saying no no here's the facts like they're the facts, mm-hmm. um, and happy you know um, I work in a high performance environment I, ha- I I have critical conversations every single day uh, I get challenged every day so for me you know words are words but put some facts on the table for me and we can have a good conversation. And, and I look forward to, um, you know, to, to the opportunities that are presented to us, um, whether, whether we perform or we don't perform, the effort will be there. That's, that's what I can promise. Good stuff, mate. Well, listen, I appreciate this. We've, we've spoken for an hour now about many different things. Have I missed anything? Is there anything else you just want to get out get off your chest before we take off? Well, uh, I think, um, you know, you talked to me about Cody, um, I want to mention him. You, you, you told me when you're working with him, I remember speaking to you and, you know, and you said this kid, this kid's a, 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 the real deal. And, you know, and I was like, okay, well, um, and I just want to say like, he, he's a, he's a, he's a beautiful young man, humble and his, and his, and he, and he's, Bolly's done a fantastic job mm-hmm. taking him over. And, 
Um, you know, you were spot on. He's a great kid. He's got a lot of talent. And, uh, you know, I'm glad we, we were able to, uh, to, to work together and you were able to, to keep him motivated and going. And, and uh, I think what, whatever successes he has in the future will be down to your belief and your drive and your, 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 what you did to get this kid going. So I hope, I hope he's um, part of the Australian team going forward, mate. Yeah, I do too. Um, he's just a typical Aussie to me, mate. He's just yeah. he wears wears his heart on his sleeve. He works hard. Um, he's he's got charisma for sure. You know, <laughs> pretty good on a guitar. I've seen him with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but he's just uh, he he um, he's good for the sport. Like he wants swimming to be great. He wants he, he's. I mean, uh, we were texting throughout the Olympics. He's pumped to see all these, you know, these kids that he trains with now, Emma McKeon, you know, one of his training yeah. partners. Yeah. I mean, he, he's as happy as anyone. So, um, yeah, it's good to hear him wanting to continue this journey to Paris. And he's in good hands with Bowley, one of the best coaches in the world. And um, I think what he's going to do for Australian swimming is, you know, he's going to continue to lift it up and then it'll in turn lift him up. So hopefully, you know, we can – get him on some teams in the future. So, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning him. Good kid yeah. for sure. So, yeah, Well, uh, listen, mate, I appreciate your time here. Um, we're going to jump off. I want you to stay on the line because I've got some things I want to talk to you about uh, privately. Okay. So um, yeah. I appreciate yeah. you doing this, mate. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, All right. buddy. See you later. Bye. See ya.